Hello, uh, I am Nikolai Kandel, and I will um, give you a presentation today uh, on a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology and uh, insect population control. During my presentation, I will go through a few questions. Uh, why do we need the synthetic gene drives? How does a CRISPR-mediated gene drive work? Uh, is any gene drive ready for field application? And do we have any alternative or less invasive methods for insect control? Insects are the most diverse animal group. They have a lot of beautiful species, but they also include less appealing species presented here in these pictures. And you can divide them into two groups, uh, agricultural pests, they threaten uh, food safety, and disease vectors, they essentially threaten our lives. So they transmit many disease. And the next slide show that the mosquito is the world deadliest animal. Mosquitoes transmit so many diseases that they kill more than 700,000 people a year. So mosquito is the more prolific killer than the humans themselves. And it's nothing compared to a shark, which um, kill only 10 people per year. Uh, these slides show the transmission of uh, many disease by, by mosquitoes. Uh, one interesting point, which not many people know, that it's only mosquito female drink blood. Males, they don't drink blood. They actually pollinate uh, some flowers and drink nectar. So mosquito drink female, drink blood and transmit pathogen. And mosquito female needs that blood to develop eggs. One interesting uh, fact, another one, is uh, that... Uh, it takes a while for pathogen to incubate in mosquito, and mosquito can transmit disease during the second bite. So in the first bite, mosquito will drink blood and essentially infect itself, and then parasite will develop inside the mosquito, and then it takes seven to 10 days before mosquito will ready for a second blood meal. And at that second blood meal, mosquito will transmit the pathogens uh, to humans. We can intervene uh, and break this cycle by reducing number of, of mosquitoes in the population or by reducing the lifespan of mosquito because if mosquito doesn't live long enough to uh, bite the second time, it will not be able to transmit disease. We can also essentially humanize mosquito, make them refractory so they don't get disease themselves and they could not transmit it. On the, and we'll block this uh, above arrow of a cycle. On the human side, we can also intervene. We can reduce the contact of people and mosquitoes. We can vaccinate people, or we can give people therapeutic um, drugs, and people will stay healthy and not develop a full-blown disease, so mosquito will not be able to transmit it. Uh, traditionally, insecticides and larvicides are used for all insect control, including mosquitoes. Uh, the big problem with that, insecticides like a nuclear bomb, we kill all different kind of mosquitoes completely indiscriminately. And mosquitoes very rapidly evolve resistant, resistance to a particular insecticide, and they adapt behavior. Uh, in a way that they minimize the contact with insecticides. As I said, insecticide kill other insect. For example, nicotinoid insecticide, they uh, kill the pollinators, such as the honeybees, and nicotinoid insecticides are uh, recently being prohibited um, in Europe. In addition, many insecticides, they also affect very conserved function, like a mitochondrial function in all animals. And they are not healthy, even for humans. And prolonged exposure to old insecticides can induce Parkinson's disease and some other health problems in humans. So what are the alternatives? Uh, sterile insect technique is very old, classic, but a good working alternative for insecticides. In this technique, large number of insects are raised in the factories. They undergo uh, some kind of radiation treatment to induce sterility. Then from this pool of mosquitoes, which are sterile, females are removed and males, they essentially distributed in the local population. These sterile males in the local population will go find females, mate with them, and then female lay eggs, but nothing will hatch from those eggs. So if you do it 
multiple times and you use the huge numbers of mosquitoes releasing each time, you can reduce population of insects. In this method, uh, which is called SAT, uh, uh, is a species specific, so it will work only for one particular species. Um, it's much more precise. And as I said, it was proven effective uh, technology, and it was applied since 1952. And the first uh, insect for which it was applied called the schoolworm fly. These flies used to fly in southern states of America and Mexico, and they lay eggs in the alive cattle and, and even humans. And then those eggs will hatch and larvae will borrow and eat living tissue. So it's obviously not a good insect. And a huge program, uh, sterile insect technique was initiated to essentially reduce population of these uh, schoolworm flies. And very gradually, it was completely eradicated from southern states of America, Mexico, and uh, Central American countries. But these species still fly and occur in Southern America. And many uh, sterile insect males of these schoolworm flies are still released in Panama to block the transmission of these flies back into Northern America. This program, sterile insect technique, is very effective uh, for some flies and is still currently used, as shown in these pictures. Uh, sterile males of Mexican fruit flies and Mediterranean flies are released in Texas and California to block transmission of these uh, flies from Mexico into the US. However, SAT is not effective for mosquito control. And one reason is because there are no good methods to remove mosquito females from a pool of irradiated insects. And you don't want to release huge number of mosquito males and females because females bite and transmit disease. In addition, released uh, sterile males, mosquitoes, they are not competitive they ha because they have a lot of uh, radiation-induced mutations and they are, they are less fit than wild-type mosquitoes. They don't compete very well. So what is the alternative for the mosquitoes? What other methods are available? Uh, in the labs, uh, many mosquitoes essentially uh, were induced to become immune to certain diseases. You can put some genes, which are called refractory genes, and block uh, infection of plasmodium, which will cause malaria disease, or dengue virus, which will cause um, dengue fever. So this slideshow publication where genetically modified mosquitoes were created in the lab, which essentially could not get sick and could not transmit the disease. So obviously, the logical conclusion is if we can just release these genetically modified mosquitoes in the wild and hope that they will repla replace the wild-type mosquitoes, then we will have uh, less infected mosquitoes and less human infections. We can block some diseases or at least reduce number of accidents of this disease. But there is a big problem because uh, transgene or disease refractory genes, which is NGM mosquitoes, uh, how do you spread this uh, gene through the population? You want to spread it fast, but uh, there is a big problem. Genes which are foreign genes, that's why they're called transgene, they are obviously reducing fitness of the carriers. So transgenic mosquitoes, as SAT mosquitoes are also not competitive with wild type, and they will not be able to spread. They will just essentially be diluted and fall out from the population. So what is the solution? The solution is a gene drive. Uh, and let me explain what is a gene drive is. Gene drive has ability to spread in a population, even if they decrease the fitness of the animals in which the gene drive resides. Many natural gene drives are known they are ultimate selfish genes. So there is a logical solution. We can reverse engineer the natural gene drive and add the genes which induce pathogen resistance, make transgenic mosquitoes, and then spread these mosquitoes in the population. And they will spread. And this idea was suggested in 2003 by Austin Bird. And at that point, it seems like it was unattainable. Uh, let me also describe how actually gene drive work. Uh, gene drive forces their preferential inheritance into the next generation progeny. 
by coping themselves or by killing the gametes which do not carry them. So this diagram will explain it. In a normal Mendelian inheritance, mosquito is a diploid organism. So it has one homologous genes from a mother, the other homologous gene from a father. So there is always two copies of the same gene. So if we have a transgenic mosquitoes and it has one copy of a gene which is labeled um, red on this diagram, so only one homologous chromosome will carry it. And it has 50% of chance to be uh, inherited by a progeny. But if you look at the diagram, you'll go four generations down this frequency of 50% will diminish uh, to a little bit more than 12% after four generations. So this means that we have a dilution effect. These genes just get diluted and it's not gonna spread. Whereas the gene drive, that gene which is sitting on one homologous chromosome can copy itself in the other homologous uh, chromosome which do not have it. And now both chromosomes will have it. And the frequency of transmission will be 100%. And then we go four generations down, and it still stays 100%. Uh, Greg Mander, who basically figured out this um, inheritance law back 100 years ago, would be very surprised if he would discover something like a gene drive at his time. And it all became possible with the discovery of a CRISPR. CRISPR essentially uh, permitted uh, engineering of synthetic gene drive. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regulatory Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. It is a part of a big uh, adaptive immunity system in bacteria. And scientists reverse engineer how this uh, CRISPR system works in bacteria and start using parts of it uh, for gene editing in all other animals. And one protein, Cas9 in particular, and Cas9 stands for CRISPR associated protein number nine. is a very, very good protein out of the CRISPR system. It is essentially RNA guided seizes of DNA. It became very popular because it is very easy to program Cas9 which part of a gene to cut. And Cas9 operates in a very diverse organisms. And next slide show you how Cas9 can uh, work as a programmable DNA scissors. So Cas9 is a protein. By itself, it's not doing anything. It needs guide RNA to essentially guide the Cas9 to a specific location based on complementarity. So the guide RNA will go, will find location, and then Cas9 can become active and cut that uh, targeted sequence and induce a double-stranded cut in the DNA. Cells, they do not like to have double-stranded cuts uh, because they're very mutagenic. They will commit apoptosis or will try to fix and uh, ligate these uh, cuts. And one pathway called end joining is simply cells just going and uh, stitching together these, uh, these breaks. And then frequently it induces mutation at the cut location. Alternatively, it can also do homology-directed repair, where it uses the region on a homologous chromosome as a template for repair. You can view it in this diagram. During this repair process, essentially, homologous chromosome can copy itself. And if it has some extra material, it can basically copy that material into the cut naive uh, chromosome, and then that um, homolog essentially will be spread on both copies. Then this process is called homology-directed repair. So now let's see how gene drive work. So here you see two chromosomes, one homologous chromosome, and that do not carry the gene called naive um, chromosome. The other one, the carrier, carries gene drive. So gene drive will make, make, make cut and then copy itself. And now this mosquito will go and mate with a wild type counterpart. And the process will be repeated. And then we'll go down multiple generation.
and then gene drive spreads. It is important to understand that uh, the tissue uh, can be of two different kinds. One uh, kind is the germ cells, the other kind is somatic cells. And germ cells do not mean that they are pathogen or bacteria. It means that the single germ cell can develop or germinate into the entire organism, which will have gametes and somatic tissue. So each organism can be thought as somatic tissue, which contains some germ cells inside. My hand uh, or, my, or my head is a somatic tissue. Somatic tissue is mortal. It will die with me. Uh, it has a lot of differentiated cells. It has a lot of mutations, but these mutations are not inherited. And it's a very important difference between germ cells. Germ cells, it's essentially the gametes in my body, the gametes inside the somatic tissue. They are immortal in some way. They are undifferentiated cells. They have very few mutations, but these mutations are inherited. They will be passed to the next generation. The sole purpose of germ line or germ cells is to maintain genetic integrity and to continue sort of inheritance to the next generation. And the whole purpose of somatic tissue ensure and protect the germ cells, uh, not get eaten by a predator. Uh, Chinggis Khan essentially made uh, Mongol Empire 800 years ago. It conquered all Russia and a lot of Central Asia. And uh, now if you go to those regions and if you sequence uh, people living in those regions, quite a few people will have some genes on the Y chromosome specifically, which will trace their inheritance to this single man, Chinggis Khan. It turns out to, that he was a very prolific father. So this Chinggis Khan and his genes, which persisted for more than 800 years among many people living in the area, which used to be Mongol Empire, shows that the germline, in a sense, can be immortal. And gene drives, they have to walk, they have to copy themselves in germ cells. This next slide shows the actual picture of a gene drive, uh, which is sitting in the gene, in Drosophila gene called white, that's YW, uh, in a, on a carrier chromosome. Gene drive has guide RNA, Cas9, GFP, which is green fluorescent protein, so we can track which flies have a uh, gene drive, and a cover gene. Guide RNA and Cas9 will be expressed. They'll go and cut uh, the naive chromosome. And then during the repair process, the whole gene drive can be copied using the HDR or homology directed repair. The next picture shows a slightly different outlook, how the process happened. And Cas9 is a scissors or endonuclease. It will be guided by guide RNA to the specific site. It will cut and then repair will take place and the gene drive will spread. And gene drive can be used for two main strategies. It can be used for population replacement where we release um, green GFP fluorescent flies and they will replace the wild type flies over many generations or they can be used for population suppression, where we release the green fluorescent flies and they will spread, but they also essentially will doom population uh, to extinction because they carry female infertility gene, for example. And so this picture summarizes that uh, different uh, fields where the gene drive can be used. Gene drive can solve very different diverse problems. Replacement gene drive can be used, used to spread disease refractory insects. It can be used to spread immunized animals, which are wild animals, and they are the source, potential source of human diseases. We can immunize them and spread them. Or they can spread enhanced threatened species, like a frog, which is succumbing to the uh, skin fungi, we can make them resistant to that fungi, and then they will no longer be threatened. And suppression gene drive, it can be used for population control to essentially eradicate um, invasive species by spreading female killer gene or spreading female infertility genes. And so the bottom of the slide summarizes that uh, the gene drives can, can help agriculture become safe and sustainable. They can control invasive species 
or we can eradicate completely insect-borne diseases. But many gene drives were actually failing in the lab, as these uh, three publications show. On the top diagram, you see that the red line should go up, but in reality, black two lines are going down. So the gene drive started to spread, but then it falls out. It turns out that the homing or coping gene drive, which copy itself from one homologous chromosome to another one, they also induce resistant mutations. These mutations are induced very rarely, but they will accumulate and they will block the spread of a gene drive eventually. So let's go and figure out how these uh, resistant mutations originate. This slide shows the actual sequence uh, of a target gene. Uh, it's a Y gene, and blue and pink show the actual sequence of a guide RNA, which is 23 base pairs. The bottom sequence shows um, amino acid uh, sequence, which will be translated from this DNA. So the Cas9 and guide RNA will go and cut the sequence at specific site. And then if repair will go through homology-directed repair, the gene drive will insert itself inside this location and knock out the gene, but it will add up to 21,000 base pairs. Alternatively, if the end joining or non-homologous end joining pathway will fix this uh, double-stranded cut, it can also insert or delete some mutations. And these mutations will cause a loss of function of this particular gene. But with some probability, some mutations will be induced, which may be functional mutations. For example, in one of them, three base pairs will be removed, so one alanine will be removed from amino acid sequence, but the whole coding frame will be preserved, or just two base pairs will be replaced. So these mutations are functional, but they are still resistant to the gene drive because guide RNA is no longer recognized this sequence. This sequence has some changes. So these in-frame functional mutations are the worst kind of resistant mutations since they preserve gene function and they are still resistant to gene drive. And that's what basically causing the failures of the gene drive. And next slide also explains it a little bit more. So in this particular case, um, the gene drive is supposed to go into the gene, which is called transformer. And transformer functions as a functional gene only in the females of flies. If you put a gene drive inside transformer, transformer will be no longer functional. And then the females will turn into the males. And that's how you can make a lot of sterile males. But if you insert some, not the gene drive, are mutations. And in blue, you, sh you see the example of loss of function mutation, which is still resistant to gene drive. Gene drive will no longer recognize it but it's not going to convert female into the, it's not going to preserve the function of a gene. So the female will still turn out to be a male because you're knocking out that gene. But in the red square, you see the fly which have in-frame functional mutation at the gene called transformer. Those organisms will develop as a female and they will be completely resistant to a gene drive, but they also will soon turn out to be a female. And they will show up with a 7% probability, according to this research. So that's a weakest point of a gene drive. So what are the solutions? The solutions are we have to target essential gene, which is very important, and any mutation in that gene can cause lethality or sterility. We can use multiple guide RNA to target the same gene in the multiple locations, so it will be harder to get uh, in-frame functional mutations. Or we can encode the rescue of a targeted gene inside the gene drive. So this rescue will have different DNA sequence, which will not longer be recognized by guide RNA, but will still be translated into the same um, amino acid sequence. And we may think about a gene drive which uh, do not rely on, on homing or copying for its spread. Is any gene drive ready for application? And yes, one gene drive which targets double sex in uh, malaria mosquito is actually um, ready for application. In the lab, uh, this gene drive copies itself in the female-specific gene and sterilizes female mosquitoes, but it has no effect on the male mosquitoes. In the lab, if you 
add these uh, transgenic mosquito to a population, you see on the graph blue and, and, um, and red lines, they spread and all mosquito become transgenic in the cage. But then this cage will produce less and less progeny because more and more females are transgenic, but they are also sterile. So this is uh, population suppression drive. And this drive is actually now undergoing testing in the semi-field conditions in the large cages to see that it will not have any kind of resistant mutations. And it's very close to application. And think about it, this gene drive can suppress population of mosquito, which carries malaria and block malaria transmission. All you have to do, you just have to spread some of the males and they will basically spread themselves. You don't have to do anything. And malaria, malaria will not be transmitted in that area. Another gene drive, another solution, which does not rely on coping called cleaver and rescue. This is very interesting drive because it's a gene drive by genetic addiction. Essentially here, the gene drive, you can think of it as a toxin and antidote. The toxin is a Cas9 and guide RNA, which go and cut essential gene, completely destroy it. So the organism will destroy the essential gene, will, will die. But the gene drive itself also have antidote. As I said, it's a recoded uh, essential gene, which is uh, resistant to guide RNA of a toxin. They also have maybe some desirable genes. And now if you, if the parents which carry cleaver will mate with wild type parents, all the progeny which will uh, survive will have to carry the cleaver gene. Essentially anybody who have a cleaver gene, cleave and rescue, become addicted to it. it you could not live without it because only, only that gene drive have an antidote. And then in the models it, and in actual tests, it show that if you have 25% of flies which have cleaver and rescue gene drive, they spread very fast for population. Our lab also thought about our system, which is a non-gene drive, uh, which is a new version of sterile insect technique. Here, we separated Cas9 from guide RNA. We essentially made transgenic flies which have Cas9 in them, in one line, and the other line have a, only guide RNA in them. But the guide RNA line have two different guide RNA. One guide RNA target the gene which is important for female development. And the second guide RNA target the gene which is important for sperm maturation. We can maintain these lines um, indefinitely as homozygous line in the lab. Cas9 does not cut the DNA without guide RNA. But then if we cross these lines together, we'll make a lot of embryos. And then those embryos will develop and only sterile males will come up after the development because females will die during the development. So we tested and have proof of principle of this method in Drosophila. We can generate light, large numbers of Drosophila males which are completely sterile, but they are very competitive because it's only one gene uh, is uh, knocked out, the gene which uh, cause uh, important for sperm maturation. <laughs> Strangely enough, those sterile males, they actually live longer than wild type males. The other important thing that all females are dying, so we don't need to sex them. Um, we don't need to separate females and males. It's done for us genetically. It is very evolutionary stable system because resistant mutations are not induced and they are not sampled in the nature. It is environmentally friendly, species specific and self-limited. It could not propagate by itself. As with classic SIT or sterile insect technique, we have to release these insects multiple times. And this, we call this technique precision guided sterile insect technique. So PGSIT sterile males are not genetically modified organisms because they could not reproduce. So maybe we can secure a legal permission to apply this technology sooner than for gene drives. It is also a logistically scalable system. We can make a lot of eggs and move them easily. So what's the future? In the future, we want also to develop PGSIT for yellow fever mosquitoes, which is invasive species. They are everywhere in southern states of America, and they can transmit a lot of diseases like dengue fever, yellow fever, Zika, chikungunya. And our goal now is to engineer PGSIT system and eradicate uh, Aedes aegypti yellow fever mosquitoes everywhere in U.S. And this particular species, Aedes aegypti, is especially a good system for PGSIT 
because the eggs of these species can be desiccated and they can still be viable for one year. This means we can generate a lot of PGSIT eggs somewhere in California, and then we can deploy them anywhere in the world. And models show that PGSIT is expected to suppress uh, yellow fever mosquitoes uh, much better than any current non-gene drive methods available. So we are looking forward to use this technology, and we're almost done building this uh, method in, inside mosquitoes. So in summary, CRISPR-Cas9 technology simplified engineering synthetic homing gene drive, but resistant mutations are still a weak point of any homing gene drive. One gene drive uh, still uh, is very going very strong, uh, and it's almost ready for deployment. It is suppression drive. The other kind of a gene drive, which is not homing, cleaver and rescue drive, will advance the development of replacement gene drive. And finally, precision-guided sterile insect technique is a very good improved version of SAT. And it's self-limited, so it can also be used for insect control. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention.